All right, so let's, can you get it back so we can talk to you? We do have some work to do. Thank you, though. This is the best I've felt for four days. And we just want you to be relaxed and everything is just What would be cool is if I could buy, I could go into my coach class seat home this afternoon and bring this and put it on it. Would that be nice? Would be cool? Five, ten would be like, <sighs> sorry, sorry. David, you're a very busy person. You've been on television recently. Uh, talk about the shows, and you just finished a book on the iPhone? Indeed. So last uh, last spring, I hosted a four-hour four Nova miniseries for PBS uh, called Making Stuff. It was about material science, which I've never heard of. Uh, sounds like the dullest topic I've ever heard. But they got this incredible, incredible production company that made it funny. And uh, I mean, I went hang gliding. I swam with sharks. I mean, all these. I shot an AK-47. Um, and then we began filming. <laughs> no, 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 but no, they tried to make it very entertaining and it got these incredible ratings, the highest ratings Snow's had in six years for anything, and so all of a sudden I'm now doing a two-hour special about the elements, the periodic table, that's on April 4th, um, that's really been fun to film, and then I'm hosting a new, I'm hosting Nova Science Now, their spin-off series, and then we're going to do more making stuff shows, so I'm, I'm sort of like... So now you're like a TV star as well as just a print guy. And you're breathing the same air. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's incredibly fun. And Look at, compare our chairs, David. <laughs> exactly. Um, Andrea, do you, do you have any questions for you? This is as long as you're relaxing. Yeah, no high stress questions. Andrea, you've done some television yourself, I understand. I have. <laughs> not nearly as much as you. <laughs> but have you fired an AK-47? I have not. I have not while sharks or yeah. cages or no. No, but I have walked the show floor all 37 miles. I have my little Fitbit on here to, to prove it. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, one question I did have is, what have you seen that's really cool? Obvious question for CES. Well, if you read my column, um, sorry, David. No, I, I think uh, the, the two coolest things were um, Casio has a watch, the GeForce watch that uses a new flavor of Bluetooth that's just going to come out this year called Bluetooth 4.0 is the consumer name, but it's known in turn and the industry is a Bluetooth LE for low energy. The problem with Bluetooth is it eats up your battery or your phone or whatever it is. Uh, this stuff uses much less power, so it syncs with your phone which remains in your pocket, your purse, your briefcase, far away, when a phone call comes in, your watch vibrates. And the caller ID appears on the watch's LCD screen. So you see who's calling, whether it's, know whether it's worth getting the thing or not. If you double tap the watch's face, it hangs up on the guy and sends him a voicemail. Um, it also, if you get a text message or an email, watch vibrate and shows you who it is. Um, if you lose the phone in the couch cushion somewhere in your house, press a button on the watch, it makes the phone start chirping at the top of the lungs, even if it was on silence mode. Um, if you leave your phone on the restaurant table or at a meeting, and you start walking away, forgetting it, once you hit 30 feet out of range, your watch goes nuts. It's if you left your phone. Oh, wow. oh geez. Um, there's a, Does it look easy? I mean, it, it, it looks, looks like, like any watch. other Casio LCD watch. So, um, if, you, uh, if you have a heart attack and doing that I fall and I can't get up thing, you hold down the button on the watch, it sends, it makes your phone dial 911, wherever it is in the house. Wow. So very, very clever. Um, right now, the number of, phone, of phones that the watch works with is zero. Um, <laughs> it should be considered a drawback. But that's only, <laughs> but that's only because Bluetooth 4.0 is so new. Um, over the, I mean, that's the whole idea behind CES, right? You see what's coming right. down the pipe. So uh, right. later this year, I expect we'll, we'll be seeing that. Um, the other really cool thing uh, is Escort, the radar detector company. They now um, have a, a module that plugs into your radar detector and talks to your uh, iPhone or Android phone, which you prop up on the dashboard, and it communicates. So anytime any Escort owner is hit by a policeman's speed trap radar gun. Mm. It's broadcast to all the other escort owners, and all the speed traps all around the state or wherever you're driving appear on a Google map on your phone. <laughs> it doesn't even seem fair, does it? Stop. <laughs> These all low-tech cops are sitting there with their guns, I thinking they're high-tech. I, I haven't stopped anyone in four days! What the hell's going on here? David, don't work yourself up. Oh yeah, where's the button? Relax, relax. You might need some of that herbal tea. Um, so, 
Well, you wrote a column a while back about your son, iPad addiction. And um, I can relate to it because I think we all have that same addiction as we grew up just in all the time. And it's, you've got more people talking about kids and technology with that column than I think 25 years of my columns and other publishing. So I, that's great because it's, it's bringing um, a lot of visibility to that. Talk about what, uh, can you give us an update to that? Sure, so uh, the column was about my son Jeff, who was six years old at the time, and when I talk about iPad addiction, I mean, he wanted it every minute of downtime. He wanted it at dinner, he wanted it in the car, he wanted it waiting in the restaurant for food, um, and he wanted it before bed, and if, and if you tried to take it away, you know, Jeff, it's, it's bedtime, dude, I gotta take this away, you literally get upset, you get visibly upset. And to me, that's addiction, I mean, it was really, disturbing and but the, the thing that makes it you know so the obvious answer is well do limit the time or take it away or teach it whatever right. but it wasn't that simple and the reason it's not that simple is because of what he likes to do on the iPad. He was not shooting aliens, he was not rotting his brain, he was not watching videos. He was doing rush hour, like logic game. He was on garage band composing freaking music. At six years old, he was doing those amazing uh, apps from school where you learn to play the, the virtual violin. Oh, yeah, which is amazing. Hold on, so I gotta turn this slide. I mean, am I really gonna say, no, 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 son, you practiced your music way too much today. I mean, I'm not gonna do that, you know? And so it was, it was, it was a really, uh, it, it, the question wasn't, is my kid riding his brain with electronics? The, the question was, um, how much is it wrong to spend so much time with the electronics when he's actually doing something that parents should be encouraging. Like, like my daughter is 12, she reads all the time on her iPhone. Um, I mean, she's reading Kindle books and Glib books. So am I supposed to take it away just because she's using an electronic to do an activity that we should embrace? Parenting advice needed, Andrea. <laughs> well, I think it actually begs the question, why is there a divide anymore? Because these items exist, the devices exist, and they're part of our lives. So why is there the divide of real book, paper book, and electronic book? They're just books. Well, because the kids, they are. Right. So that would, that would be the argument. Um, except that he's, it's electronics. Isn't that, aren't they inherently and bad in excess? Plane, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Go, about, go get fresh air and sunshine. What's well, that, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, so that's the point. It's like I, as a parent, get nervous because he's not getting fresh air and sunshine, he's sitting in front of an electronic all day, but then the other side of me goes, but he's, he's expanding his brain, he's, he's thinking. So this is the update. So the update is, um, I still limited the time, I, it still may be uncomfortable to see him on that thing all the time, but the latest thing is, he's, he comes up and he goes, Dad, he's seven now, can I borrow your iPhone? This kid is smart. <laughs> can I use your iPhone? If I use it to write stories. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, God. You're really not going to make it easy for me, are you? And so I said, you know what, Jeff? You're in first grade. You're learning to read and write. I'll tell you what. You can use my iPhone all you want as long as you're writing. I mean, that seemed like a no-brainer, right? So can we evaluate that? Is this the right move, audience? Raise your hand. Did you do the right thing? I can tell a lot of people are still nervous. But it's a gadget! Right. He's, he's writing. Now let me, you haven't heard the whole story. So, so I give it to him in the car, and he's very quiet. My older two kids are 12 and 14, much older, so we're all talking about this and that, things that are going on in the world. And he's in the back seat, very, very quiet. And every now and then I go, Dad, how do you spell accept? <laughs> well, Jeff, how do you think it sounds? E-X, right? E-B-T, there's a C in there. And then, you know, five minutes, Dad, how do you spell crocodile? You know, like, Okay, he's working on something, and this is unretouched, okay? I had nothing to do with this. I haven't even read it all the way through. This is from a couple days ago. I haven't even looked at it. He doesn't want me to look at it. This is what he wrote. I mean, I'm not saying it's Dickens, but I mean. There was a family far away from any house. Every person that came near that house got a curse. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> and no one knows who lives in that house except for one kid. They say he uses spirit, and they also say he's a ghost. Everyone always bows when he's close, and by close, I mean a mile away. He's still mastering quotation marks. Um, <laughs> nobody ever talked to him. Well, actually, he wouldn't talk back. Also, <laughs> he talks like he talks. Um, also. He
He's the only one that can go close to the house. You don't need to know any of that, except for everything I told you. <laughs> Let's start the actual story. One day, the ultimate kid disappeared. Jeff, it's bedtime. But I mean, that must have taken him half an hour. But I mean, come on! Who wouldn't encourage this? So now I'm really freaking torn. Now my kid's sitting there all day, but he's, he's like, that'll be the next Hemingway. I mean, he's no, not. But, no, it's okay. You're a proud father. I, I would like to see Hemingway's seven-year-old attempt. Yeah. Okay. Hello. And I think, dum dum dum. I know! I, I see. his garage band score. <laughs> But I see humor, and I see, and he's, he's got a bunch of these. Um, the, uh, you know, with my eyes the way they are, I wish I had that all the time. Um, so here, these are other attempts that he did. And the, the interesting thing is um, that he'll ask me how to spell a word on one of these stories, and then he will, um, let's see, oops. And then, oh, sorry, I just showed you that one. You just, you just turned off the lights with your Bluetooth. <laughs> <laughs> Are you comfortable by the really really cool some water? I could use some more vibration, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> we need some, whoa. Are you, don't let the wind the bright lights. Somebody leaning on the switch by accident. Yeah. Um, so what's really interesting is he'll ask me how to spell accept on story number one. And then a couple days later, he'll do another story where he uses that word and he won't have asked me how to spell it. So that tells me that he's, he's learning, he's learning how to spell. And, I mean, so, David, I have a PhD in educational psychology. Help me, Doc. Touch the hand. <laughs> <laughs> That's really okay. Yeah, started right with the uh, mommy expert uh, and family uh, journalist, and we can give you advice. It's going to cost you a touch, but David, relax. This is awesome. And I think most of you would agree. Yeah. You follow a child's intrinsic motivation, and I don't know how this kid could have picked up an interest in writing. Hmm. <laughs> I wonder where that came from. So, yeah, I think it's great. So, so none of you has any problem with the, the fact that this kid is, I mean, he's still addicted. Get him a typewriter. Get him, yeah. So that's it. But that's the crux of the issue, says get him a typewriter. So really, would we all feel better if he was doing the same thing on a typewriter? It doesn't make any sense. One of those royals. That that writing is writing, right? Get him his own iPhone. Oh, shut up! <laughs> Does he have physical activities? I mean, that would be the only reason he doesn't have Yeah, I mean, he does other stuff. He plays tennis, takes Taekwondo. And... Sounds awesome. Yeah. They can sit in the sun and write. What's that? They can sit outside in the sun and then write. <laughs> <laughs> Go outside, get some fresh air and sunshine while you're riding your brain. Uh, yeah. That's a good idea. Can you write person? Not on the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I don't think they teach cursive until fourth grade. I think they stopped. Really? But you can write. Yes. <laughs> what would you rather have? A burned out middle schooler with perfect cursive or a kid that can write? I know what I prefer. So I, I guess the so gist of all that, I mean, everybody asks, I speak a lot for colleges and stuff. And and everybody asks me, oh, these kids today, they don't have any social interaction, they're sitting behind Facebook, it's all isolationist, it's all uh, losing people skills. And, you know, the thing is, if you step back, you'll find that this kind of generational concern has happened with every single cultural shift there ever was. You know, the Beatles, you crazy kids with your long music and your loud hair, you know. And, um, you know I'm sure it goes, but, you know, I, I'll bet when the typewriter came, came out, they're, you know, you're rotting your brain, why didn't you write with a quill like the rest of us? You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm sure every time there's a change, there's a reaction to this movement. And, I, you know, can you imagine the, the caveman, you know, like, the wheel? Why can't you walk to the woolly mammoth skeleton like the rest of us? You know, it's like, I'm sure it's, it's just built in. The change is right. And we're well, having so much. Think about, you know, when iPods came out and everyone started putting earbuds in their ears. And nobody was talking for a while. I mean, and you go through that cycle of, Wait a minute, you can't just tune out and not communicate with anybody and you know, you go through that cycle and then another cycle as all these things kind of find their level. Look at our song guy over there. <laughs> I mean, he, he's supposed to be monitoring our song. He's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> he's not Do you have another one? Do you pay attention? <laughs> this is what we're doing right here. No wonder 
sure China's gonna eat us for lunch. <laughs> Those darn white things in the ears. I, I love going up to a kid. I, I got a group of teenage girls that come to my house every morning, and one of them has uh -huh. ears. Uh -huh. I have two teenage daughters to go to school. To backpack. And one of them has earbuds in, and I always like love going up to her and say, "Hi, can you hear me now?" You know, she's like. So she pulls out one earbud and says, okay. Hey, can I make a 40 second total digression that has nothing to do with education or anything but concerns everyone in this room? Absolutely. So uh, what makes earbuds work is a rare earth element called neodymium, okay? Rare earth uh, elements are neodymium and cerium and... So you've been doing a thing with the periodic table? <laughs> yes, yes, That's I casting. <laughs> Continue. This is obviously because I've been working on this Nova session about the is elements. Is there neodymium? Go ahead. Neo yeah, neodymium. Um, which is interesting because in this whole series we interviewed like 30 scientists and none of them can pronounce neodymium. I mean, it's weird, it's their job. They're like, neodymium, neodymium, neodymium. No, that's not what it is. Anyway, um, but these rare earth elements, which are misnamed, they're not really rare, they're actually more abundant in the earth than lead, um, but they're very hard to separate. So they're called rare earth minerals and um, they used to be relatively worthless. They were the trash fish of the ore deposits. Um, but they are now the core of lithium ion batteries and every app phone, every smartphone, um, I, iPhone, Android phone, iPad, electric cars. And buckyballs. And buckyballs are right. And buckyballs are neodymium with iron and boron mixed in. Super magnets. Um, uh, televisions, flat panel TVs, the colors are formed by rare earth elements. So what have I just named? I just named every major technological development from the last 15 years. Smartphones, flat panel TVs, electric cars, all of it relies on this stuff, okay? Where do rare earth elements come from? China. What percent of the world's rare earth elements come from China? 98 per... <laughs> what are you, a scientist? Scott trailer. Oh. He has Wikipedia in his brain. Oh my god. 98 percent give the man a stuff down. Uh, you reach your call on. 98 percent of rare earth elements come from China, which is fine as long as we can get a copious supply from China. But Scott, what has China been doing for the last two years? Not playing nice. Right. China has been throttling down exports 30 percent a year. By the end of this year they will be exporting zero. And that's so what they're thinking is why should we export these essential elements to the rest of the world to support our economy, to provide jobs here, when they could get us to set up our factories over there? Because they've got the rare earth elements we need to make the stuff. It's ingenious and scary as hell. We all are worried about the oil shortage? Dude, that was a warm up act. What if we couldn't have batteries? Okay. Much better. Okay. It's all right. Uh, we need some herbal tea fast here, folks. This is. But don't you think we all need herbal? I mean, isn't that terrifying? And it's this great. I mean, Congress knows about it. The scientific community knows about it. But the people don't know about it. But this is going to be the end of our iPhones and iPads and electric cars. Should we? And after we've all become addicted to them. After we've become addicted. Right. So, what is the government doing? The government has gone to the number two rare earth elements deposit in the world, which is. Mountain Pass, California. It was shut down 10 years ago for, uh, for uh, environmental violations and because nobody gave a crap about these rocks. But all of a sudden they're super valuable again and essential to our national security and our phones. So they have just spent the last two years gearing up to reopen the Mountain Pass mine. They expect in four years to be producing 25% of the world's rare earth minerals right here in the US of A. Isn't that an amazing story? Premiering April 4th on PBS. <laughs> is, is the real estate there? Is the real estate there? No, but you can buy stock in this company. I'm not allowed to do it. It's called Molycorp. Is the company MOL? They used to make molybdenum. They started with molybdenum, which is another rare earth mineral. Um, now they're making all the different. They're, they're like 17 rare earth elements, and they're they're going to mine most of them. Uh, at this, at this one Maybe we should occupy something over this whole issue. <laughs> occupy the lived in them! Uh, anyway, wow. That amazing? Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, Stop texting. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, education. Well, that was really related to uh, family technology. <laughs> it will do.